Uh, this is uh, guys. Uh, welcome to the session. See, basically, uh, the reason why I, I brought up this topic is because you know um, we are generating a new class of employees in the tech world now, right? People who are skilled but who don't want to be part of a regular organization. Uh, basically, exactly what we were discussing now. That is a context, right? So uh, we are not comfortable with the um, you know the hard and fast hierarchy of an organization, or you feel the um, your creativity is not uh, completely utilized there. Uh, or you feel um, you want to uh, experience more variety. So for various reasons, there are a lot of people who are branching out and going out on their own now, and I am one of them. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the topic I chose because I thought it was of great relevance to people uh, who are uh, either working on their own or who are at the starting phase of a new, uh, minute germinating a new idea, a product idea, and they are still in the nascent stage. They still can't afford, you know, they still haven't got their funding uh, right. They still haven't got their uh, first customer in, and you know, it's just this extra struggle phase the product ideation phase so in that phase you know you can't tell them go buy licenses license product for this and that and you know they want the ready-made ecosystem of tools which will uh, a small team can utilize and maximize their time and effort okay so that is the purpose of this talk so welcome to this session i'm going to talk about uh, not strictly 10 maybe 12 or 13 tools apps and platforms for the gig economy so by gig economy i mean either individuals working as skilled techies or small teams who are in their nascent stage of uh, development product development okay a little bit about myself so uh, uh, why I, I talk about this top topic is because it's a topic that uh, is very close to my heart simply because this is a, a small a small extraction of the journey that i have been through and the tools that i've used maybe five years back and the tools i'm using you now are different so it's a constantly evolving process so but the areas of uh, the tool where you apply the tools now the areas are the same the needs are the same probably the tools will get better with time but if i just wanted to identify the areas where you can avoid a lot of manual and repetitive low skilled work and you can automate those activities from some using some useful tools and platforms so i i am basically a, a product and technology consultant for startups so my uh, roles are generally maybe sometimes it's as short as a few weeks Sometimes it extends to you know one and a half, two years, three years also. It depends on uh, my the nature of work I, I get involved in. So uh, the um, uh, idea of uh, doing a, a consultancy for startups is not really uh, straight jacketed into you know I'll do only uh, product architecture for you or I'll, I'll do only UI design for you or I'll do only business consultancy. Nothing like that. Depending on what is the need uh, at that moment, I will take it up. So that is why I said in general, I said consultant. Then, but of course, my mainstay has always been corporate training. So it's um, a training on technology uh, for not only companies, for also uh, uh, colleges and engineering colleges and stuff like that. And then uh, 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 because I, I have even I'm one of the oldest pioneers of work from home because I've been working from home for the past 12, 13 years and I simply love it. And blogging seems to be the ideal fit for that. So that is the reason why I love blogging. So I'm a content writer for uh, uh, blogs and websites and stuff like that. And of course, most importantly, how I'm associated with Devopedia is just that I'm one of the four trustees of Devopedia. And as you can see, the other two trustees are the attendees in the call today. OK, so welcome aboard. So this is a little bit about Devopedia and uh, where we stand. We uh, we have we made very humble uh, uh, beginnings. So uh, we are uh, just a passionate group of people who are a tech community platform. Uh, and our goal is basically dedicating ourselves to the IT community and uh, disseminating free knowledge, free information. OK, so this information may be in the form of articles. It may be in the form of workshops, maybe in the form of tech talks sessions. We don't really have a brab, you know, a, a, a specific format wherever, whatever is the need, uh, the best form available for a particular concept which you want to pass across. If it if it is best conveyed in the form of a blog, we'll do it. If it's best conveyed in the form of a talk, we'll do it that way. So our idea is to learn. Uh, we basically we are just looking for an excuse to learn new technologies and pass on our experience sharing. So these are some statistics about Devopedia. We have about uh, 2000 users, uh, about more than 100 authors who are active. And uh, presently we have a repository of 350 articles and uh, 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 we may not have a very large um, uh, repository of articles. It's fairly limited, but whatever we have is well researched and uh, well cited. So the quality of our articles is what we are generally good about. Uh, and that is the reason why we get cited quite often and we get good number of article hits. OK, so now let me jump into the topic um, uh, we have picked today. 
So uh, what are the typical jobs that a gig worker can do? I'm talking about jobs that an individual as a as freelancer can do as well as small teams. You know, small teams at their nascent stage of creation where they are still ideating their project. Where they have not yet formed a formal organization setup. What kind of jobs do we have to do? First of all, you have a product idea in mind, which is very vague. You know, you have some sort of a target audience and some lacunae in the target audience. You want to meet that lacunae using some product idea. So you need a product architect who can translate business requirements into product requirements. Then you need a manager, of course, to do your overall planning, scheduling, tasking and all that. Then your developers, testers, your DevOps guys, because nowadays um, the when I say product, 90% of the products are actually de deployed as SaaS, SaaS services, right? So um, you need a DevOps guy on board. Then you need UX designers because um, uh, products which are poor, even very good products, if when their UX is poor, they just fade in the market because you have to hit that one right use case which hits at the heart of a business, you know, heart of a uh, target user. So you have to get the uh, UX design. Uh, UX design is not UI design. It's UX design. Designing his overall experience. Then of course you have to you have, um, you have typical freelancers doing blogging training. Then there are there are so many social media free influencers now, not just on the you know cookery or the travel side, even on the tech side. There are a lot of social media specialists on the tech side who promote articles, blogs, and uh, comparative analysis and white papers and stuff like that. And then you have customer success executives who are who are actually hired by startups, uh, especially uh, to once they get their enterprise customers on board. Now suddenly they have a need for a, a dedicated customer support team, so uh, they cannot afford full time guys. So they uh, they they scale up and down depending on how many customers they onboard. So customer support executives are also uh, onboarded as freelancers. So what are the typical activities these guys do? Uh, communication, um, information sharing with teams, with clients, with the various stakeholders, uh, planning deliverables, pricing. See, the problem with uh, freelancers is you have to, you're, an, you're a one man army, right? You have to do, you have to plan your deliverables, deliver them yourself, price it yourself, est estimate your effort yourself, or everything you have to do yourself. Then uh, you are actually working as an island from your home, but then you are collaborating with a larger team. So collaborative design and development. Coding, debugging, unit testing, version and release management, automation, UI prototyping, modeling, visualization, web app development. All these constitute a, a modern day project development environment. So these are uh, initially, you know, freelancers would just think about, you know, I, I'd just be a coder or I'd just be a blogger or a trainer. But now freelancing ever since COVID has really spread out into all business functions. So why are freelancers preferred? Uh, is just is this is just my take on that. Uh, why freelancers are preferred? One reason is being uh, uh, it's a one man or a woman army where uh, a, a skilled individual, especially a senior skilled individual, can be hired on a short term basis. So just for the required duration on a need basis, you can hire a skilled individual. For example, product architecture, you want to get the basic um, uh, use cases in and you want to develop the basic overall product structure, the uh, three tire, four tire architecture, whether it should be a web interface or an app interface or whatever it is. The basic ideas, are you get them going with a, a very skilled team, get, then get your funding in, then you can afford to get, uh, hire your own, um, you know, the entire uh, suite of um, engineers and all that. So that is the reason why in the initial phases they prefer senior techies as freelance support. Of course, they have a cost constraint. So cost constraint works in two ways. Cost constraint, uh, seniors like um, uh, people like me who have more than 20 plus six years, years experience in the industry. If you have to recruit me full time, then you will have to probably pay a lot of money and you can't afford it as a startup. And more importantly, you don't need me full time, right? Because uh, over a period of time, as we were discussing, uh, you will use me. It's basically a use and throw model, right? You use a you use a senior person, get the uh, basic things done, and then you can employ uh, junior people and get the uh, uh, everyday tasks done. So that is why uh, there is a lot of need for um, startups, especially in the initial phase. They want senior people. Uh, another reason being. Uh, when uh, a startup employs a senior free and freelance techie on uh, in the initial phase and when they go for investment, uh, make an investment deck pitch, you know, when they say so and so is on my uh, team, it adds value to their credibility, right? Otherwise, if I say I'm just a bunch of three year, three year old, three year experience guys, eight year experience guys, the investor is not completely convinced. But if you say a 20 year experience guy who has been a product manager who's been a system architect, he's helping me out. So that sort of guy adds credibility. So these are all various reasons why today's world freelance techies are preferred. But of course, of course, you'll have, you'll have to be good on your skills. 
diversity of skills is the of course the first point so the, uh, the uh, startups are not you cannot straight jacket yourself in a startup saying i will do only this i will not do that because they themselves don't know what is the scope of work every day it is constantly evolving constantly changing so freelancers are very valuable there because you would have worked with multiple clients you would have had varied set of experiences quite opposite to what a, a, a enterprise guy would have experienced enterprise guy he will have more in depth experience whereas a startup guy i mean freelancer will have more in breadth experience so that kind of experience is very valuable in the initial phase of a product development on the other hand what are the challenges that a freelancer faces again the uh, what is a plus point is also a minus point you are a one man army you have to do all the assigned tasks yourself monitoring scheduling communication pricing payments everything you have to do yourself so uh, you are pricing your job only for the actual deliverables but you can never effort estimate for the overhead jobs like you cannot spend you cannot say i have attended um, uh, so many hours of uh, meetings or i spent so much of time doing um, um, effort estimation you cannot bill these things right you can only bill on deliverables so these are all overhead effort which you will have to undergo there is of course a severe cost constraint uh, we cannot afford to buy uh, uh, if you are in an enterprise you take so many things for granted right even your office 365 license is a big deal for a star, for a for an individual sitting at home uh, if you have to buy a, a, a decent pc uh, you have to buy a mac you have to buy a uh, office 365 enterprise version you want to buy some other licensed products you are a ui designer you want to buy photoshop it costs a lot of money so cost is another major constraint from the uh, freelance point of view then credibility is an issue okay credibility how do you build a track record how do you fetch your first customer how do you go on with that how do you go on building on your success story this is a huge issue and it's a curve it cannot be achieved overnight you get you start make a humble beginning and humble beginnings are always made through direct proper channels in your first circle of acquaintances your colleague would have joined um, some some other startup he'll pull you in or you know you go back to your college and you meet your alumni and they ask you for something this is the way most of the freelancers get their jobs they do not get it through all this you know these um, uh, so called freelance portals and all that hardly 10% of work comes through proper channels 90% of the work comes through informal um known or uh, known acquaintances from friends and family another big challenge we face is no backup suddenly you have an emergency in the family and something and you you deliver you have promised some deliverables and you are in soup you don't have a backup so that is a, one of the biggest problems of a startup of a, of a freelancer so how do you overcome that either you buffer your work or you you, you have to you have to um, you, you have to have a standby you have to have an arrangement some, some for many of my training programs i have a stand in arrangement with some friend and uh, you know i'll do two days and then i'll suddenly branch off and my friend will do two days so we have these sort of informal arrangements that's the only way it works so given this sort of a, a background of what we face what sort of tools and uh, platforms are helpful to us is what we are trying to cover okay so these are the set of tools that i have picked for today is this a, is this comp list comprehensive not really these are the tools that i have found useful in the last maybe 2 years and as i told you tools are constantly evolving so probably if you ask me to do the same session 6 months later i'll give i'll come with you i'll come to you with a different set of tools today i find these tools very valuable okay so i have divided my uh, tools into um, uh, basically uh, let me may probably start with a disclaimer the categories of activities that i have listed here are categories of activities that i have been doing predominantly there may be so many other activities which you know i have not been personally involved in so i don't want to talk about tools which i have never used so that is the reason why i have restricted the list to tools which i have personally used and these are the sort of jobs that i have done in my journey as a freelancer so that's why i picked only these topics so this is not an exhaustive list this is only my set of tools that platforms which i found useful of course most of them can be expanded over other business functions too i'll probably touch upon them at the end so some of the categories i'm dealing with is prototyping and demos because this is a um, uh, this is the you know step one hurdle for any startup when you come with a new product idea i think ram will agree with me you have a business idea you have a product idea in mind but it's vague until you actually put it down onto a web app or a you know or a mobile app or whatever you see it on the screen your ideas until you concretize them na you yourself don't have clarity on what the user is expecting and what what gap you are trying to fulfill so prototyping demos ab testing these are all activities which are critical even if you have a clear cut product idea in mind 
and when you have a hazy evolving product idea all the more important if your customer is a constantly evolving you know in today's world who is your customer a freelancer's customer is a startup so uh, the customer is also a fast changing guy right because he has to talk about his end to end he, his end customer if he's a b2c guy he has to find out what is what clicks with the end customer what clicks with the end user so he is constantly evolving so because of that your requirements are constantly evolving so with this kind of a scenario prototyping and demos becomes a critical activity demos also one aspect of demos is getting your customer in place another aspect of demos is getting your revenue in place so you make demos you make an investment pitch um, maybe um, sometimes you get, you have a good pitch you may have an amalgamation with another startup you build you build together or if a product reaches a certain threshold then you get acquired by somebody else so for at every stage at every milestone of growth right you need to have good demos of your product uh, you may have a trial license you may have you know a limited version enterprise version say limited version you give it for three day three day basis two day basis whatever it is so you have to think about how you can product how you can uh, uh, productize your idea and present it as early as possible you have a mvp uh, minimum um, uh, viable product which you can present to the end user and collect feedback as soon as possible so our uh, three tools i found useful for this are figma uh, code sandbox.io and streamlit streamlit i figma i think many of you would have heard but the other two things i'd i'd like to show you slack and teams are no brainers uh, the reason why i picked uh, slack and teams is because these are the obvious choices in com communication information sharing i'm only going to talk about some special aspects of slack and teams which are probably lesser used less frequently used aspects where i'll probably uh, share my experiences on them for collaborative design collaborative development i picked up a couple of uh, tools um, uh, miro and maze are good tools i'll, I'll explain them google firebase of course is easy to understand because um, uh, you can't start with an aws or an azure or a, so you start with something simple you want to see your product out there um, how it looks on the cloud so you start with a google firebase then i'm talking about the crm aspect managing your customers managing deliverables managing uh, leads how do you convert your leads to actual um, uh, quotations how many people have you sent proposals to how many people have responded how, how, what is the funnel what sort of conversion ratio you are having you need this information even if you are a freelancer you need this information so i found hubspot very useful for this then of course comes reports and visualization for almost every saas product that we build nowadays we expect some kind of mis reporting right you want to show some sort of a uh, output a dashboard or a report or some sort of visualization you want so i have picked two tools which are useful for that and finally of course of course i'm talking about basic product management tools for productivity improvement so these are the tools i have picked i'm going to uh, just short summarize each of these tools in one slide that's the plan for today okay so i'll probably go on for the next uh, maybe uh, 30 40 minutes and then i will stop and then we will share ideas because you guys might have used a lot of these tools so we will share ideas so probably i'll just uh, uh, take a break up front and ask how many of these tools you guys have used anybody who has used any of these tools yeah <coughs> slack teams okay anything else yeah, this, no teams teams and streamlit to an extent i have used okay not the rest right okay so i'll probably talk about them then you'll you'll get a good idea and since i'm just going to touch upon each of these tools um uh, i've given some links and reference points so that you can refer offline you know because we are covering so many tools we will not able to do any one tool in detail so you can always uh, go back and offline you can uh, uh, refer them in more detail okay so now let me come to topic number 1 which is prototyping and demos so uh, figma is a uh, is a really good tool okay so figma is a prototyping tool where uh, it's a, a what you see is what you get kind of a tool and it's actually a no code prototype development tool the best part of figma is it is a collaborative ui tool so you and i are sitting together and uh, you know you can design together and you can uh, and it's just a drag and drop sort of a use user interface so you can create user interface flows on the fly in a team or just on a teams call it's as simple as that prototype development is as simple as that i've just shown a, a, a static snapshot here i will also show a dynamic version of uh, figma so figma actually divides your uh, ui um, your product ui especially figma is a ux design so a little bit of workflow also you can design the back end side the workflow also you can design but it's primarily a end user uh, uh, workflow tool okay so it allows you to uh, uh, define a dynamic workflow so you can actually define the flow 
you know, uh, the positive flow, negative flow, validation flow, abnormal flow, exceptional flow. You can define everything in Figma. You can do validations. You can do um, uh, pop ups. You can do everything, everything at one shot. So you can actually 3D visualize your product even without the backend at all. It's a dummy flow. So it's very um, useful because um, you can bring your customer on board on the same tool. You can show him a quick demo then and there. You can bring your entire development team on board. So, for example, I'm a UX designer. Then um, Arvind, let's say, is a UX. Usually, he's a uh, developer. He's a React developer. Then there is also a backend guy, a database guy. Then there is a customer fellow. All people can sit together and collaboratively they can design the UI in Figma because it's an online tool. It's a web tool. Okay, and uh, the best part of Figma is most of the features that a small company or a freelancer needs are free of cost. Okay, only exhaustive set of pages and prototypes you want to keep on creating only then you need to buy the license. Just a few number and in one page itself you can create multiple prototypes. So you don't really need to buy the product at all. And in there itself you can embed your conversations and all that comments, reviewing, everything can be done on the tool itself. So uh, the uh, user workflows, I'm going to show one of the workflows in my demo. So the design pages can be directly reused by the front end development because it gives you the assets um, when you and it also allows you to componentize your UI. OK, so for example, you have a table structure, you want a tree structure, you want to how, how, you, how should a text box look, how should a comment look? You want to have some annotations, you want to have some drop downs, whatever it is, charts, visualizations, whatever it is, you can componentize it as simple as componentizing font color size throughout the application. You can componentize everything. The UX designer who is not a coder who can componentize everything and give it to you as a ready made package of assets. Those assets can be directly imported into your React application or whatever front end application you're developing, Python, React, anything. And those HTML, CSS, you can as it is adapt and start coding. So there is no such, it's an evolutionary prototype, basically. It's not a throwaway prototype. You take it, your actual development team can directly build on it. So that way it is very useful. OK, so whether it's a uh, app or a website or prototype, anything you can do. Now I'm just going to click on the uh, demo and show you uh, one of the startups that I'm working on. I guess I'll just show you that. Let me close some files because. Uh, it'll be uh, it'll be faster. OK, so I'm just opening my Figma page. So um, um, uh, in this startup company, now the UX uh, developer uh, has developed some sheets. I, I'm just going to show you a couple of them just to give, give you a feel of how it looks. So uh, the OK, so there is a, a edit view and there is a, a share view. Uh, basically, you can give only like a, it's just like PPT. You can, uh, you know, uh, edit. You can keep the PPT file, whereas you can send only the PPS file to somebody and he can see it only as an executable, right? That sort of a thing can be done. So you share only a, a view role to somebody or demo your customer. He can see the entire flow as a dynamic running flow and he will comment or he can even come on board and he can he can comment uh, collaboratively or uh, real time. So like this, so I'm just going to uh, maximize. See, as you can see, what you can see here are multiple screens and the screens are all buttons and icons. Everything can be put in one place as resources, as assets. OK, so uh, I'm just maximizing the screen a little more. So this is my screen design. OK, just some some general, some general screen. OK, some some sort of a list view. So uh, then and there you do a demo and you say, OK, boss, this is not OK. I want this to be dupli. I want this field to be duplicated once again. So copy paste and then there itself you can create the assets. So this um, UI design becomes a, a um, on the fly sort of a job. OK, so you want one button. You want to add one more button here and there. There and there itself you can add. There itself you can add validations. There itself you can have a dra 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 drop down list of uh, predefined values, data types, date component, whatever it is. All those sort of things are built in. So uh, this tool uh, uh, is actually a uh, we in startups. It is extensively used, extensively used because um, uh, the app even before the back end is ready. Now these startups typically they like to present the front end to the end customer and tell him boss, this is what I'm going to deliver. Then you get your funding in, you get your enterprise customer in, get a purchase order in. Then you recruit your backend guy, Python guy, and then you get a DevOps guy. Then you get a tester. Those guys are not even there, you know. They just recruit a React guy and a UX guy, and then they, they just get the business flows up and running on Figma, and that's it. They present it to the customer, they get their order. 
only then they start recruiting on the back end side so this is the reason why they want very good professional looking uh, uis so that's the reason why figma is very popular because it doesn't make you realize that there is no back end it's a dummy it doesn't make you realize that okay so this is my tool number 1 so you can do everything positioning and scrolling and orientation and uh, flows and everything what event no event notification push pull everything can be done in figma okay so this is my tool number 1 so now i'll probably close this and i will go to tool number 2 okay so figma is one okay this is my tool number 2 tool number 2 is streamlit.io streamlit.io is actually a library where you can uh, the best part of it is it's a it's an open source library it's a python library and it is uh, very useful when uh, especially when uh, there are tip, some typical projects which are you know data intensive projects right where the uh, visualization part takes back seat what sort of data can you extract how can you transform that data using the right ml models and what kind of output um, maybe uh, you want to show some trends or forecasting models or whatever it is right so you want to do um, a quick poc on the data models that you have designed you have designed the ml models but you want to see it in the in the front end without investing in front end development so this is the opposite of figma you have your back end you have done your back end part you have actually done your um, uh, dimensioning of all the sides you have probably you have, you have probably chosen your model already you have a uh, solution ready but you want to see it you want to see it in a quick fix sort of an app you don't want to develop the entire ui for that sort of a thing this streamlit ui is very good because it is a primarily no code ui okay it's a no code app, uh, app, app ui so it allows you to connect to different different databases and especially enterprises where they have disparate sources of data right some data is coming especially these fintech apps you know they use this um, streamlit very 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 effectively because they have data sources coming from um, they have live ticker stock data they have uh, historical data they have sap data coming in real time data then they have um, uh, you, um, some things are on files on local disks on excel sheets they have all sorts of data so all this data you can you want to present it to the user in one quick way just a dummy ui you with it's a no code interface so quickly you can choose your different i i've just shown you a, um, a pic snapshot here na you can choose your different data sources you can uh, build the relationships between them online itself drag and drop relationships and you can create the ui there and there okay and i'm showing you a demo uh, this was done actually for one of uh, one of one poc concept which we did for an NL nlp project the nlp project is simply to check language similarity okay so uh, uh, i i've actually given a, a sentence also at the bottom now so i'm just saying anu owes me 50000 rupees i want to return the thing uh, return the money soon at the same time another sentence is anu borrowed rupees 50000 from me i would like my money back soon so both these are english sentences i want to do a similarity check between them so this is a simple nlp model that we did okay so actually this was done for a legal product but i'm just oversimplifying things for you so in a legal product you will have different different clauses now so you want to compare similarity between clauses and say okay this contract this contract it's compliant it's not compliant for that sort of a thing so that i'm just the demo is is relevant in that context okay so i'm just going to click the demo okay this is the demo so this app is built on streamlit okay so what is the app it, what does it do it goes to the back end it pulls out the different uh, different categories of uh, clauses and uh, it gives you a uh, this is one source this is another source and uh, this is just doing a text comparison and it's giving me a similarity figure 95% is the similarity figure so if i take the text from uh, that I, if i just remove this and say anu borrowed whatever so, and then here i type some other text and then i do a similarity compare it will tell me what is the similarity similarity has reduced 28% it's as simple as that okay so this sort of a thing for quickly testing your ml models streamlit this is very good guys it gives you results within half an hour one hour you will have a front end so i have found it very useful okay so this is my app number 2 now let me come to app number 3 sandbox basically sandboxing is a uh, is a fairly common idea but this uh, uh, code sandbox or io tool i found it very useful because it gives me a 
developer environment but on a cloud system so you can deploy your product then and there a cloud if you let's say you are de deploying something on a temporary cloud you know or, or you have an aws or you have firebase or whatever it is you already have a, a deployment setup ready let us say uh, and you want to have a, a quick fix of you want to change something immediately want to see the re reflected idea on the deployed system so you want a coding as well as a deployment environment at one shot an all in one sort of an environment otherwise what we will typically do we will do we will be using an ide on our local disk and then we will keep on saying do a deploy maybe we'll do a ci cd and all that you'll use your jenkins this that that you'll compile you'll do a unit test and then you'll finally you'll deploy but that is okay that is okay for production environment for a test environment for a trial environment you don't need all that now so for a trial environment i quickly use this code sandbox in fact most of the uh, freelance tools that we use uh, which are there in the market now uh when uh, especially libraries which have free uh, small free versions and then they sell the paid versions to enterprise customers they give demos trial versions or demo versions they use code sandbox.io so they will give you especially if they have python libraries you and they allow you to customize their libraries and all that no so you can take their library you can download their uh, custom uh, custom library suite you can um, make changes and you can immediately deploy and see and if you like it only then you buy that product so you free version is given to you in this format so you as you can see you can upload the library it will give you a, a directory structure a tree structure like a project it will give you a code um, interface id interface there itself it will give you a, um, a deployment interface it will also give you the uh, end user result so this is basically some sort of a pdf rendering app okay which i have which i am trying to show you it's a pdf rendering app and i'm showing you the ja uh, javascript code as well as the pdf which is being rendered inside a uh, uh, inside a web viewer sort of a thing so this sort of a uh, application we developed because we wanted to uh, write down some um, uh, annotations on top of your pdf document you know some custom annotations like for example uh, i'm developing a on a collaborative review tool okay it's something like google docs okay so i am developing a collaborative review tool me and arvind let us say we are two reviewers um arvind wants to put in some comments i want to put in some comments arvind's comments maybe i want to do some red lining some strike throughs or maybe some commenting or some rollback or or maybe i have some recommended data i want to replace this this text by some other recommended clause that sort of a thing so basically we developed this using sandbox.io and we immediately deployed it and we saw the results right away so it helped to save us a lot we didn't have to go back to the developer each time and say boss i made this change can you show me how it looks and all that so the turnaround time for quick prototyping was very good with code code sandbox.io so when should you use streamlit when should you use sand code sandbox streamlit to use when your uh, application is data heavy your uh, ui look and feel does not matter at all you just want to see some quick result maybe a, like i like i showed you know a percentage result or something like an election forecast um, um, a will win or b will win you don't care about the ui there right you just want to show some pinpointed result so for that sort of a situation you use streamlit but if you have actually a, a ui to render and show then you use code sandbox especially if you want a development environment embedded into the tool then you use code sandbox so these are the three tools in prototyping which i have found very useful in the last few months okay any questions on this section or shall i go to the next section quick thing streamlit cannot be deployed on server right ah uh, it can be but not uh, not so easily it can be uh, actually okay it can be but uh, it's not easy okay that's something i was trying yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. primarily it is for uh, testing your local data no so most of the people do local host and just check can be done with it hmm. but it can be technically speaking it can be okay i'll check on that thanks yeah. okay shall i get on to the next section yes please okay so design development deployment what are the sections okay this is one good tool uh this is a tool this is like this is like a whiteboard it's a digital whiteboard and it, the best part of this whiteboard is it allows plugins to all these modern day saas saas tools okay so all these tools guys that i'm talking about now these are all unicorns which have emerged in the last maybe one year and they are actually doing a fantastic job you know so the tools that big enterprises use and the tools that these startups you know i am working with some some you know these emerging companies like your zomatos and your ethers and all that i've i've seen a little bit of the way those guys work 
they just don't think in the way we large company enterprise guys used to think right? they think they think completely differently their life cycles are so short their life cycle is so dynamic their requirements are so fastly evolving so they cannot survive with your old and day style of requirement traceability matrix and you know unit testing tools and the old language is gone they completely talk a different language so these modern day tools when they are all integrated into a suite you know they actually yield very good results and miro is one such tool miro is like an umbrella tool it's a whiteboard sort of a tool where you can collaborate anytime so you can collaborate what i mean by collaborate is see uh, this category i have i've categorized miro in uh, in design and development actually miro can be categorized as an information sharing and a communication tool also because it's a whiteboard basically so you can collaborate and add um, uh, plugins for figma adobe you are using adobe for uh, let's say photoshop or you have invision or you have uh, power bi or you have any, any of these tools you know or you have your teams or you have uh, jira for tra tracking your um, uh, product uh, progress or you have uh, asana cards which are for your product management tools whatever be the sort of tool you can plug it into uh, miro and it will give you a uh, integrated uh, whiteboard so you are chatting on one uh, on one tool then you are suddenly uh, um, scheduling a meeting on teams then that fellow is sharing something on slack everything you can see in one place so that is the reason why miro is popular and uh, the the two i have used only two plugins on miro one is uh, uh, google meet and one is figma so uh, though both are very good seamless very good okay and things which i have seen but i have not explored in detail are use by specific templates so miro has templates you know for everything uh, especially for um, you know these uh, business use case uh, tracing for example you know what is an empathy map no empathy map is uh, you have many uh, user requirements but what hits the thinking exactly from the reader's point of view from the user's point of view how do you empathize with his pain points the customer's pain points so you trace a user's journey and you find out which is his most severe empathy point and for that you show a workflow immediately yeah, you will be able to hit the customer uh, where it hurts so that is when you know, the connect will be established between the product you are developing and the customer so those sort of things are possible with predefined templates in miro so uh, very quickly a customer will be able to decide whether your product is a fit or not okay and then of course and, um, all the tools that i am talking about no this is a, a, a common um, um, sentence that i have added the free version itself is enough for freelancers and small companies you don't need to buy the unlimited version so until now until all these tools i don't have any of them at paid versions i don't have all free versions okay so i have just shown you a dashboard sort of a thing of all the apps that are um, shown uh, i have not used all of them but uh, i i have known that my friends who have used almost all of them and they swear by me by miro so let me quickly show you a demo of miro how it looks so i think i am going to show you the figma plugin of miro that is what i was using last yeah so this is the figma plugin so as you can see i already showed you figma so uh, why i am using this is because here itself i can click here and i want to put some information on slack i can click this right click and i can immediately say on slack share some information saying um, um aram can you change this title to something else so immediately he'll get a message on slack or for example you want to click this window and uh, you want to schedule a google call um, gmeet call only for this you click on this and say schedule a call you call the uh, stakeholders for only this part maybe the ui guy and the react guy so only those two guys will get a G uh, google meet call and those guys can get on a call and immediately rectify the problem so that sort of a thing so um, i'm just showing you two uh, plugins which i have used but apparently the other plugins are also very good okay so this is about miro then let me come to the slide yeah i'm done with miro let me go to maze maze is a testing tool especially useful in ab testing uh, ab testing is a concept which is very popular in startups reason being uh, you have some conception of what the user is expecting and you have designed your workflows based on that conception but there are multiple ways of rendering that idea a workflow in the ui right for example i give you a simple example um, um uh, you want to do a multiple choice select you can use a radio button or you can use you, you can use a drop down so for which kind of user what should you use 
should you use a pop up based uh, UI um, uh, UI or should you use a, uh, a collapse and expand sort of a um, card based car? You keep on developing cards. You just collapse the cards then and there you keep on adding or no, no, no. You want to do a create from regular traditional way. You click a create button. The pop up will come. So you have multiple ways of implementing the same business function, but you don't know which is the best. So what you do in those cases is you do a B testing. You deploy, you segment your user into, you know, uh, uh, some set of users will get one, one, one view, one, one um, UI design. Another set of users will get another UI design. Apparently, Amazon does this all the time. And one of their biggest success stories, case studies is Amazon used to have these coupon code things. Na? They have a coupon code and all that. No, so that I believe they had put it along with the purchase page earlier. Then they said when you put it so late, uh, then the actual effective price that you pay, um, uh, it is shown, the discount is shown very late. So they realized that just by pulling out that coupon code, uh, apply coupon code and get a discount feature, instead of putting it in the payment page, if you put it on the uh, initial page itself, when they show the product listing, if you reduce the price then and there and show it to them, the kind of traction they got was so much higher. So how did they realize this? They use tools like Maze, which we give, which give you a quick prototyping and testing solution where you can deploy multiple uh, UI vend versions, segment your users into say, um, or you can segment in many ways based on age groups, based on cities. I'll give you a very simple example. All Bangalore guys will get one kind of a UI, pop-up based UI. All Chennai guys will get, get a right-click based UI. You can segment your user base like that and you see what sort of response you're getting. You respond, you measure the response conversion rate, it's funneling and all that you measure at the end of two months. You see or oh, not even two months. These guys only do it for two weeks. Two weeks they will measure what kind of responses they're getting. Whichever is getting better response, they will deploy that. So for that sort of a segmenting and testing, you know, it's called a in fact the test tool itself is called a five second test. That's the most popular test in uh, maze. Do a five second test. You you can be there itself. You can ask the user. Uh, did you like this feature? How would you rate this feature on a scale of one to ten? If that guy says only four, then I will automatically switch to the other version of the UI. So for these kind of concept and idea validation, Maze is very good. So you can uh, it gives you a dashboard. It gives you statistics, everything. You know, use your segment of users. Um, did they drop out at the first screen? Did they drop out? Drop out at the second screen? Where did they face a bottleneck? It gives you everything. How much of delay did it cost? Did they click help? Where did they get stuck? Everything. Then um, uh, it also um, gives you a pool of uh, research participants. Um, you can set a um, basically you can plug it to LinkedIn or you can invite your um, um, research participants using email, LinkedIn, whatever. So social media plugins are also there. Then content and copy testing is basically how you communicate with your users. Um, the product success is basically messaged. Uh, messaging matters a lot, right? So especially in the initial days. So you take your feedback from the user. You immediately go back to the uh, team. You reflect and you come back and you redeploy the uh, change solution. So you can keep on checking incrementally how your um, uh, product conversion ratios are improving. Conversion ratio, I mean, such as um, uh, how many people convert from, uh, um, first of all, how much time they spend on your application. Second, how many people convert from uh, just users, uh, anonymous users to signed in users. Then how many convert, how many uh, convert into demo users? They want, they click and they do a demo, they do a trial. Finally, how many convert into paid users? So this sort of a tra tracing you can do and Maze is good for that. Again, the basic version is free, so it's perfectly OK. Then I come to Google Firebase. Google Firebase actually um, um, it was one of the popular uh, uh, freelance tools once upon a time and Google simply acquired it because it was becoming popular. Uh, it's been around for um, I think almost 10 years now. Yeah, I've written that also. It's 2012 it was acquired by Google. It's a backend as a service platform. OK, so backend as a service means it's a it's a DevOps tool. So it's a very powerful class platform database for uh, uh, it, whether it's a web development, mobile de app development. Uh, it gives you support for various data sources of um, uh, Google uh, cloud. Uh, basically, your, 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 it can be a private cloud, public cloud. It can be an SAP, SAP system. It can be uh, local databases, file systems, Excel, uh, real time um, uh, inputs coming from web, everything. It can pull data from all these things and then it allows your hosting of uh, your app on um, multiple um, uh, ways. You know, you can do your uh, React based apps, Express based apps. You can do Kafka microservices. You can do HTML, basic HTML, CSS. It allows support for everything. 
then the free services of firebase it is convenient for beginners to understand see the problem with in fact this was what we were talking about in the starting right the product guys uh, are senior guys they are able to visualize the product at macro level however the developers are all very junior guys they have they are not able to visualize in its entirety at all they are developing just one particular page or one particular feature they don't know where it fits in the larger ecosystem so for those kind of guys it's very useful to immediately deploy it on a firebase and show them boss this is how the screen that you are developing this is how it's going to use look this is how the user is going to use so if you if they can immediately deploy and check they will get a overall idea of what's happening and another useful aspect is of course analytics and messaging and security google security everything is plugged in so they of course the entire google ecosystem comes into play right your you can plug in your gmail and this and that you so that that's the best, best part of firebase so i found firebase useful for uh products who cannot yet afford an azure or an aws until then they can start with firebase but of course it it cannot scale and it is not um, it will crash if you have more than 1000 users at a time and all that so th that's a given right because it's free but it's okay for the initial deployment phase where you are never going to onboard more than maybe 20 users 30 users it's perfectly okay it works very well no problem at all okay the next one is um, uh, uh, machine learning is another big advantage for data for data science apps where you want to do you know um, uh, bar code scan bar code scanning or you know nlp or labeling or sentiment analysis uh, face detection but you want to do it a, like a poc like a small thing for those kind of scenarios this is excellent google firebase is excellent okay now i come to category 3 a category 3 i'm not going to spend much time slack and teams um slack is of course you guys know uh, there's not much to discover and discuss about slack uh slack the uh, one part which i have found useful is keeping um, uh, your slack connect um, that is um, especially people like me for freelancers uh, who are working with multiple companies at the same time okay so i have a slack channel for one customer i have another slack channel with going on with uh, maybe a college where i am doing training another slack channel where i am doing something else when i am doing blogging uh, another slack channel so basically i can compartmentalize my work so my tool is the same my slack is the same but i can come within slack i am able to compartmentalize my work so that is the way i find slack useful okay and of course you quickly share your uh, snapshots or quickly if quickly um, you do a chat or you you probably um, uh, schedule a call or whatever it is that way it is useful but off late i have found i also used to swear by slack more than teams but and i hate i used to hate teams because i even today i feel teams does not have a good intuitive ui at all okay that is why people say zoom is so much easier and i think arvind and um, ram and i we have discussed this many times when we started the text text tech talks should we do it on zoom should we do it on meet but finally we settled on teams because it allows you to record that is one very very useful feature another thing is the intuitiveness of the ui you set aside the calling aspect you set aside but there are so many other things in teams which are very very useful you know guys especially i uh, let me add this caveat especially for users who are already microsoft 365 subscribers so um, small companies they they start off with 365 on a uh, on a on, on a small scale then teams becomes very very useful because uh, it is free for 365 subscribers and um, uh, the the best part of teams which i found useful was, was seamless integration between microsoft outlook and teams so scheduling meetings doing a chat immediately coming back here joining your meeting then the same participants you you run a particular activity so basically you are doing a meeting online you are doing some discussion the same group can shift over to an activity chat on teams and they can do an offline discussion so you don't lose context then again one week later you can meet again the same team online so that sort of a blended conversation is very useful on teams okay then uh, 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 one other thing i found useful was uh, scheduling calls with customers um, this email calendar outlook and finally microsoft 365 integration right your ppts and your excels you can share there itself sharepoint so this whole microsoft ecosystem comes into play and that is pretty decently integrated i like that part and there is also a useful feature of onboarding guest users where you can give limited access and all that that is pretty useful in startups because uh, you don't want to um, you know expose everything to everybody right so you can restrict their usage to maybe uh, one, only one channel or only one activity that sort of a thing so this is about slack and teams so i have covered three topics already 
uh, I'll just stop out here and you have any questions. Nothing. Not a question, just comment time check 10 more minutes. Yeah. Then we can have some Q&A. Absolutely, absolutely. OK, so in this section, I have only one tool, which is HubSpot, HubSpot. OK, HubSpot is a CRM tool and it's an inbound marketing tool. OK, so basically what it means is you are getting information from uh, uh, people are uh, uh, seeking you and coming in, uh, coming in, uh, uh, giving you uh, marketing dates. How do you trace them to closure? You measure their uh, uh, execution, measure their uh, conversion rates. And uh, you can schedule appointments. You can you can check the current status of a deal. Um, so many different customers are there. So it gives you a dashboard of uh, you know each customer where you stand. Demo is given, or uh, um, or he rejected, or he said demo is done. He wants a follow up, or he's waiting for a technical techno commercial proposal, or um, he's saying I am doing competitor analysis. So immediately you can trace. You can write down which are the competitors, and you can find out who are the stakeholders. So all this information, CRM related information, you can track on HubSpot. It's pretty good. Again, HubSpot is uh, you know it's all part of the same startup ecosystem. It is linked to Miro. It is linked to Figma. It is linked to other product management tools such as Asana and all that. So all these guys, you know, they work as a team. So they have and very good integrations. Social media plugin is another very useful this thing in this because uh, today uh, CRM and marketing is heavily social media dependent, right? So you can have LinkedIn plugins, you can get um, so you can have blog posts and you can get your um, comments from the blog. You can directly put it here. Uh, if you have um, um, uh, customer calls scheduled and then um, uh, the uh, whatever call you were discussing, the meeting minutes you can publish here and imme immediately you can get feedback from the customer. Techno commercial proposals, pricing you can track, everything you can do here. And it has good support for computer analysis also. OK, so the example I've shown you is just a dashboard, but it's a very good CRM tool and the minimum free um, limited version is pretty decent, which is all I have used and it's pretty decent. So it allows you to manage communications. It allows you to manage your contacts, the marketing and sales channel separately service customer service that is you can manage separately after that is post sales service. Basically, then you can also do your reporting and um, uh, track. Finally, I'm coming to the last two categories, reporting and visualization. I found two tools very useful. Uh, one is called Grafana, one is called Kibana. Okay, Grafana is a visualization tool. Uh, it is a, almost an extension of Streamlit, you think. Okay, Streamlit is giving you just one point information. If you want to visualize that information, you can use as a further extension of Grafana. So Grafana will give you the regular stuff, you know, your graphs and markers and uh, heat maps and graphs, tables, text panels and all that. All that is supported, but it is supported in such a way that it is a no code interface and the visualizations can be customized using a drag and drop dashboard. So you don't have to do any coding for getting your UI components on place and you can um, also check which you you can you can measure the effectiveness of each visualization component then and there. Then uh, you can uh, also do uh, uh, mapping between the visualization component and the data source. So once you do that mapping, real time update will keep happening on its own. Then uh, annotations are another very useful aspect of Grafana. You've got some data on a on a heat map, let us say. Then and there you can annotate. You can say, okay, uh, I'm annotating a threshold of 15% is the maximum uh, 15, uh, 15 percentile top. 15 percentile you can add it with the top 15 percentile then and there on the visualization tool and you can say this is my threshold below this i don't want to cross those sort of things you can do then and there on the visualization tool where i have seen it used a lot is in these iot based projects you know where for example you have uh, sensors placed in say atms or sensors placed in mines where you have a lot of temperature sensors, this sensor, that sensor, and all that, you know, all that information is coming in. And you want to show a dashboard to some remote guy sitting, some admin sort of guy sitting in some remote corner, and he's doing 24 bar 7 monitoring. Even the CCTV, no, apartment CCTVs, even there, this sort of information is very useful because you do a computer vision sort of thing. 99% there is no there is no movement. You have 1% there is a theft. There is some user, some somebody, some intruder coming in. So quickly there will be a, a alert saying, oh, there is some movement. So this guy has come in. So you will get an alert on your um, uh, on your um, uh, screen saying, boss, uh, I saw some vision uh, uh, data using my IoT sensor. I could see some movement, uh, abnormal movement. So it's an alert. Please take action. So for that sort of thing, I found Grafana very useful. Basically taking data for real time data from IoT and visualizing it. 
Next is the Kibana is a tool which is very useful for uh, elastic search. What they mean by el elastic search is a word that they have coined. Elastic search means these uh, you have in uh, machine learning, you have a lot of these semi automatic models, right? They are neither complete, they are nor. So you, you do a little bit of labeling, you do a little bit of cleanup, you do a little bit of standardization for those sort of uh, semi models. Um, Kibana is very useful. OK, so for example, you can you can build cap, um, query query uh, um, string such as I've given an example products dot um, uh, taxless price um, is greater than so much and the category is equal to women's clothing. So this is the, the sort of um, filter that I want to apply on my um, search and for that I will do a visualization. So this, uh, this is basically for generating MIS reports in the company. Companies know they keep asking for different different reports in different different formats. No, every quarter they want a report or every weekly meeting they want a report, status report. So there is so much of mundane activity, repetitive activity happening. So using Kibana, you can set some predefined elastic uh, search models and you can predefine the report format and those reports will get auto generated. So your quarterly reports, daily reports, status reports, whatever it is, you can auto generate MIS reports. It's very useful for that. So it's actually a tech stack. They have a visualization tool. They have a DB tool for semi-structured data. But they also have a log tool which will parse the logs and it will collect information from your logging. So this is the way I have used Elasticsearch basically for uh, generating MIS reports. So I, I, I for reports where you know you show some um, um, uh, deviation reports, compliance reports, audit reports, those sort of things. Then uh, you can again you can visualize data in multiple ways, histograms, graphs, pie charts, etc. This is about Kibana. Then last category is productivity improvement. Uh, uh, this tool is called Asana. Asana is about making different different task cards and project workflow cards. You know, so basically Asana is a modern day uh, Microsoft project, but it is a, a very intuitive and very nimble lightweight sort of a product. OK, so it allows you to create project workflows at a basically it's a top down project management tool. Um, the uh, the startup guy probably is hardly have working with four or five guys, right? Four or five team members. So he will design the uh, overall product workflow, what he wants in what order. For first week I spend on demo and prototyping. Second week I do some sort of uh, this, then I do competent analysis, then I do this, then I do this, I do this. I define some sort of a overall workflow. Then under each business function, I develop an in-depth workflow. This workflow directly you can start assigning team members directly. You can start um, uh, assigning the deliverables and track their close track them to closure. And if there is any uh, carry forward, it will automatically do, uh, uh, you know, uh, pushing the other milestones further and all that. It will give you a deviation report. It will give you a, uh, which which who is your bottleneck uh, employee. And if uh, if something is stuck with an external stakeholder, you have sent something for review. It's not come back or you're waiting for some license to get approved. Some all that information can be tracked in one to notes uploading files setting deadlines then um, uh, it will give you you know uh, uh, it, it's dashboard the best part of its dashboard is at you know the problem with many startups is at one instant in time at one at today's instant of time i take a slice of time i want to know where is my startup headed what is the current status i don't know if i ask ram today ram what is the present status for him to give me an answer, he'll probably he paraphrase it in 10 or 12 sentences. Instead, if he has an Asana dashboard, he will know exactly where he stands. And he can show this to even an investor saying, boss, this is my journey. 40% completion, 60% per day. This is where I stand today. These are my bottlenecks. These are my challenges. This is where I stand. So it's a very useful uh, product management tool. And again, I told you all these guys are interlinked. This guy will interlink with the Dropbox and Slack and Miro and Maze, anything. So all these guys, they are very good at, um, you know, mutual benefit. They keep a very, very good ecosystem of shared tools. Again, free version is free, uh, with lim limited functionalities, and it is pretty decent for small teams up to 10, 10, 12 members. It's perfectly okay. You can again like a Slack, you can shift between multiple workspaces. So maybe um, you're dealing with, you know, um, multiple functions. So if you are a CEO, founder sort of guy, you want to do some sort of project management with the funding investment that side. Another side you want to do with the customer side. Another side you want to do with your developers on the uh, development side, HR side, paying side, pricing side. Everything you can create separate, separate um, workspaces and you can deal with them separately. So there is all that visibility and, you know, read access, write access and security. Everything is there.
okay so it's very popular in startups who are employing a mixed combination of full time and freelancers so you can um, you can give limited access to the freelancers full time access to those guys then deliverables can be shared all that is possible so this is another tool that i found very useful so i am actually done with my list now i'll just open the floor for questions so i don't have a question and rather but i think this was a very useful and very concisely developed design, i mean presented talk i really found it very very useful thank, thank you. you thank you my pleasure anybody else any question no questions uh, it was very nicely presented exhaustive one and the reference material i would see it as yeah. i'll come back to this thanks sure sure as you use these tools now as i told you it's constantly evolving so um, these tools are today's slice of life for me if i find more tools probably i will update them later but for now whatever links i have shared na you should be able yeah. to find it yes i'll find it thanks okay that's it from my side then good evening guys